probably seen it before, the Gardner Hype Cycle. I love this. Uh, this is for emerging technologies. They do several. Uh, but really, I'm just trying to set the scene for where we're trying to do forensics. Uh, it's in a changing and diverse environment. This gives you some idea of where different techno technologies are at the moment, where they're expected to go. Uh, I'll come on to some more. Uh, I just happen to think that the Gardner Hype Cycle gives a good dotting of the relevant technologies you're going to expect. Is everybody happy with the Gartner Hype Cycle? What it means? You've got your innovation trigger, then you've got your peak of inflated expectations where everybody thinks it's going to solve everything. Then once you've got that, you've got the trough of disillusionment where people realise it doesn't do what everybody thought it was going to. And then you've got it at the adoption phase where it comes into its productivity where people have learned what it will and won't do and they start to use it properly. That's roughly it. Uh, not every technology follows that cycle, but most do. Because they get over overhyped at the start, uh, and then when people realise it won't. So, uh, but it's not the cycle, it's the technology that's mentioning that's more important for this one. Developing environment. Porous perimeters, convergence, complexity, globalisation, virtualization, cloud computing, Android. That's a nightmare. Android is hard. As are iPhones and I, iOS. Uh, but now we've got the Internet of Things with embedded devices. Uh, and they're all relevant. Uh, and I'll come on to why we call it digital forensics, not computer forensics. Because it ain't about computers anymore, nor has it been for some years. It's about digital devices, processors, uh, at the bottom level, embedded processors. Uh, so all of these things are changing and affecting what we can do and how we can do it. That's really all it's about. Just a few of the new technologies, some not quite so new, but you start to get the idea. We talk about, you know, in forensics, what what does forensics mean? Sorry, I'm just aware. I was told not to wander too far. <laughs> what does forensics mean? The only meaning of forensics is acceptable in a court of law. Forensics itself has no other meaning. If it's forensically sound, it means it's acceptable to a court of law. Uh, we tend to imply various things from that. But really, well, that's the bottom line. Uh, so that was a very quick diversion. Uh, again, some of the new devices. Uh, uh, right, the trigger for that. Vending machines for mobile phones, for throwaway phones. When you're doing digital forensics, you're trying to put a face activity if you have no traceability of the source, who was using that phone, those go phones, uh, it becomes very difficult to tie an individual. Not impossible, but increasingly difficult. Instead of it being prepaid phone attributed to an individual, even then it's not easy. Uh, sorry, I lent it to someone. It was my son, it was my daughter, it was my wife, it was my friend, someone borrowed it on the street. You know, uh, how do you attribute that activity to that person? Uh, so, all of these sort of things make life more difficult. Uh, everybody, I think most of those are fairly self-explanatory. TPMs. Anybody heard of TPMs? Trusted platform modules. How many of you got a laptop, desktop, that's been produced in the last four or five years? It's almost certainly got one. Although you won't know about it. Uh, it's a technology that they've been embedding for some years now with the intention. Trusted platform module allows you to store stuff in hardware rather than uh, as days on my disk. Okay. Uh, I will pick on solid state devices. If I thought Android was a pain, solid state devices equally or so. 
uh, for different reasons. Uh, your wallet on the phone. Uh, your contactless credit. Uh, you've got a contactless credit card, but now uh, using the phone as your wallet is coming along. I picked up mobile data. It's just one that I could carry on all night, but that's not the point. Uh, mobile traffic grew 81% in 2013. Uh, Last year's mobile traffic, this is only mobile traffic, 18 times the size of the entire global internet in 2000. So in 14 years, mobile traffic alone is 18 times more than the whole of the internet. Uh, mobile video traffic, 50% uh, first time in 2012. So more than half of the traffic on mobile devices is video. That's because everybody's watching catch-up TV or YouTube, mostly. Uh, half a billion mobile devices added. This is additional connections in 2013. Uh, I spent the last four years out in the Middle East, and it's quite strange. People don't tend to have landline phones, but they will have two or three mobiles. They'll have the work mobile, personal mobile, and some of them have the girlfriend's mobile. But they will all have at least two, sometimes three, or more. Uh, right, uh, connection speeds getting better. We've been through 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G's coming. Uh, if people want video on demand over their mobile, we've got to have the bandwidth to support it, basically. Uh, and I wish BT would get my landline speeds up to the same sort of thing. Okay. I think we have to understand uh, computer crime, which we tend to talk about, digital crime, uh, is not just about computers. It's about any sort of crime. Uh, extortion, credit card fraud, identity theft, etc., etc. Sabotage, uh, terrorism. Uh, I, I struggled with the term cyber terrorism. You don't scare me with a computer. And terrorism is about terrorizing. Um, terrorist use of the internet? Absolutely. They use it widely for recruitment, for money laundering, for all the rest of it, communication. Uh, but the only way you scare me with a computer at the moment is hold one above my head and threaten to drop it on me. Um, so, that's not to say we're not going to get there. Uh, but we're not so dependent on the technologies yet that the loss of them would cause significant problems. Uh, who remembers Y2K and the hype about Y2K? It, it was interesting. I, I did a presentation to uh, Gatwick Airport. And I identified 67 systems that if they failed would spoil your day. And this was on a journey from your home to get on the plane. The one given was planes weren't going to fall out of the sky because nobody could afford that to happen. But we actually identified 67 systems that, from traffic lights to building management systems, all the way through. Uh, but the whole point is, you know, there was a lot of different systems that could affect you, but nobody got terrified. Uh, okay, different attack methods. The top one, social engineering. Um, social engineering is still the easiest way in. That, and by that I mean you either persuade someone on the outside or you persuade someone on the inside. The insider is always the easiest, best access, best knowledge, easiest, already trusted. Uh, and a whole range of types of attacks. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, what is ABT if we go back to Aha, sorry, yes. Advanced Persistent Threat. What's that? Advanced Persistent Threat. Thank you. And this is, the term was coined to describe, basically, uh, nation states using uh, cyber espionage, uh, subversion. <coughs> uh, and it was primarily coined about the Chinese. 
the Americans, I think, were the ones who coined the phrase to describe the activities of the Chinese, because it was persistent, it was ongoing, and it was, as it happens, state-sponsored. APT doesn't have to be state-sponsored, uh, because you've got organizations like Anonymous uh, that are classed as APTs. But, uh, you know, you should also add countries like, or, you know, almost anyone you can think of, because almost everybody's doing it. India, Pakistan, America, Germany. We got very offended when the Americans did it to them. Um, the UK. Uh, <coughs> it just describes a, an ongoing level of activity. Uh, good question. I tend to put these things in a get to describe them. Okay. Putting computer crime in perspective, um, I use digital crime and computer crime interchangeably because uh, I started off doing computer crime and it migrated to digital. Um, so I still tend to use both terms. But for where it's got computer, we digital. Uh, average bank robbery, this, these are figures from the States. Nets around $7,500 a robbery. Cost about 60 million a year overall. 16% of the money is recovered, and 80% of the offenders go to jail. Most of them get caught eventually, well, each time. Uh, white collar crime, uh, $10 billion annually. Less than 5% go to jail. Uh, you have a difficulty taking a digital evidence-based activity to a court because they don't understand it. They don't understand the words you're using, they don't understand the technology. So convincing a jury of your peers uh, what you're talking about and what he did. If, if people can picture someone walking into a bank with a gun, you know, they understand that. Uh, and they understand the sort of emotions it causes. Uh, they see it as victimless. Oh, you know, it didn't hurt anybody. It didn't come out of anybody's bank account. Um, however wrong it might be, this is people's perception. So very few people get convicted. For, get, no, I'll rephrase that. Very few people get caught and convicted. Because you've got to catch them first. The other thing is, to do a bank robbery, you have to go to the bank. Yeah. You've got to physically be there. So things like CCTV, uh, people on the street will see you, see the vehicle you're driving. You don't have to be in the same country to conduct a digital crime. And in fact, most people aren't in the same country for that very reason. Uh, so then you've got jurisdictional problems. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you just look at the UK and you think about digital crime, uh, chief police officers or 47 of them, uh, answer to their local community. They're funded locally, they answer locally. So why does Dublin and Cornwall, uh, why would they see the need to fund a computer crime unit that deals with crimes in America? And the answer is, very difficult for chief police officers police officers to give it any sort of priority. The only reason they will give it priority is because of paedophiles. And everybody hates paedophiles and can understand why you would need a unit to deal with that. But that's not what digital crime is actually about. It is a digital crime, it's a, but it's only one of them. Uh, interesting side note. Uh, we used to do a, an annual survey and we used to go out and buy three or four hundred second-hand computer disks, and we'd buy them on eBay and computer fairs and the like, and look at what data people left on them. Uh, because, and if it's a private individual's computer, uh, it's not unreasonable. You don't expect them to have the skill, the knowledge, to be able to get rid of all their personal data. Uh, corporates have a corporate liability and corporate responsibility and they have the resources and should do better. They don't, by and large. Uh, we discovered some stunning uh, 
lapses in security. The point I'm making is every year we used to end up reporting two or three discs and handing them over to South Wales Police, who used to dearly love us for it. They did pick on the workload with that bits, uh, but it's a reportable crime. And paedophiles would sell their second-hand computer discs with data still on them, or with data that was recoverable. They might have deleted it, but it was recoverable. Um, so, uh, you know, be careful. Okay, we need to sort of look at the past to look at where we're going. 62% uh, of all web traffic is not generated by a human. It's generated by a bot. And we all tend to think of bots as bad, but not all bots are. There's network monitoring bots, there's all sorts of other bots out there, there's not just malware. But interestingly, most of it is malware. <laughs> uh, it's just not all of it is. Uh, in the second quarter of 2013, uh, percentage of spam uh, out of the total increased by 4.2%. This is in one quarter, it went up by 4.2%. Uh, which meant that just over 70% of all email traffic uh, was spam. Now, we don't see it in our inboxes because it gets filtered out mostly. Um, the reason it went up was because there had been, over the previous two quarters, they had taken down one of the largest spam producers, uh, with the result that there had been a big drop. And this was the market, the spam market recovering, if you like. Largest botnet, 30 million plus hosts. Goes back to 2009. Uh, Microsoft Vista, <coughs> the late, it, sorry, it's an old operating system. It's the latest one you can get statistics for. Over 50 million lines of code, uh, 500 man years of effort to produce it. Uh, first patch, 38 days later. And Microsoft, I will, we all have our thing about Microsoft, they are one of the few software manufacturers that actually has uh, quality built into their process. And that includes security and other software manufacturers who don't. Uh, that's a different story. Uh, if you have an unprotected PC, Time taken for it to be infected by malware is less than three days. Sorry, less than three minutes. <laughs> three days, I wish. Uh, if you just plug an unprotected PC in, less than three minutes, it will be infected. Uh, good reason to have a firewall, a couple of antiviruses. Uh, process control systems and SCADA are we're talking, you know, I've said it's digital forensics, it's not just about computers anymore. And increasingly, uh, we're going to the Internet of Things. And lots more process control systems and SCADA systems are being put onto the Internet. That makes them vulnerable. Um, who's got a smart meter in there? Who's had smart meters fitted? Anybody? Interesting thing, they're not building much security, it depends on which one, you, <laughs> who's the manufacturer is, but most of them are not putting security in. Uh, and we reinvented the problem we had with SCADA. You know, SCADA was never designed to be put on public networks, it was private networks, so the security wasn't a major issue. Uh, then we put it on the internet, and it became one. Now we're doing the same with uh, smart grids. Um, so, we've also seen it, hackers, uh, I'll call them hackers, crackers, etc., etc., um, used to do it for peer recognition. Now they do it for money and for profit. And that is significant uh, because people are, it's criminalization of it and organized crime. Organized crime will follow the money. Money's gone online. Organised crime has followed it. Uh, and we're now in a, a world of ubiquitous communications. Uh, I went out to Romania last year, uh, over New Year, and 
No mobile comms. No mobile coverage. Shock horror. It's, it takes about two days to get used to it, and then you sort of think, this is quite good. <laughs> Don't have to answer emails anymore. <laughs> Uh, there are still parts of the world, but we notice it when we don't have them. We expect ubiquitous comms. I already said what forensics is. It's acceptable to a court of, year, court of law. The question is, is it a science, digital forensics, is it a science or an art? We want it to be a science. Description of what a scientific method is body of techniques for investigating phenomena, acquiring new knowledge, or collecting and integrating previous knowledge. Uh, method must be based on empirical and measurable evidence. Uh, interestingly, in digital forensics, it's gone back to the drawing board. Uh, SWG, uh, Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence, which is the body, if you like, has now raised the question what should the definition of digital forensics be? Uh, which is sort of scary 20 years in. Uh, but the question has again been raised because the, question, the answer is less clear than we thought it used to be when it was computer forensics. Uh, so it's changing. Uh, the sad thing is we're going to move more to our, towards art than science. That is almost inevitable. Not foregone, but despite the fact that we have it, the processes in place to put uh, more regulation on the practice, to put uh, better, more standards, better standards, more standards. I just finished writing a book on building a forensic lab to be standards compliant. And you would think ISO 17025, that's the forensics. ISO? Mm, yeah, it's one of them. Uh, but you can't ignore 9,000, 27,000, 27,023, uh, uh, There are actually about seven standards that apply to you doing forensics in a lab or in the field. Uh, test question. Anybody know who, what Fry and Daubert are? Uh, I'll, I'll say it. Okay, forensics. First forensic lab was built in France in 1910. Uh, Lockard. Uh, and you've got Lockard's exchange principle, which holds true. And that is every contact leaves a trace. Every action leaves some, uh, I won't call it evidence because it's not evidence, but it leaves a trace that it's happened. There is no such thing as, someone will tell me I'm wrong, there is no such thing as a piece of malware that can infect your machine, carry out an action, destroy itself and disappear without trace. There must be something there. You know, even if it's just the bit of software that deleted everything else. Except you'll say it's in RAM, so we'll come on to that. Okay, uh, most acceptability of evidence, although we're in UK uh, and we come under AGPA, I'll come on to them, uh, it's almost universally accepted that Fry and Daubert Fry was 1923. It wasn't talking about digital evidence. It was talking about acceptability of evidence in court. And they had a lot of, uh, I wouldn't call it fake science, but certainly a lot of questionable science uh, in the 20s. And so they came up with this concept that it had to have gained uh, general acceptance in the community, academic and scientific before it would be accepted. Uh, and that the court would decide what was and wasn't generally accepted. Uh, Pseudoscience, that was the word I was looking for. Uh, quack science. 
Okay, so that was the first case, 23. The second one was 1993, uh, Dowd v. Merrill. Merrill Dowd. Um, both American cases, but the first two to address uh, acceptability of evidence. In Dauber, Judge came up with four things. Testing. Has the procedure that was used to gain the evidence been tested? If it has been tested, what was its error rate? Because nothing works perfectly. Uh, has it been peer-reviewed? Has it been published and peer-reviewed? Has the community, and this is general acceptance coming back in, in just been slightly better defined, but has it been subject to peer review and comment? And is it generally accepted? And those are four actually not bad rules when you think about it. If you want to be talking about using scientific principles and methods, and those are fairly fundamental. Uh, ACPO came up with four principles for digital forensics. First is, don't change anything. Second one is, if you have to change something, uh, as a principle one, you should aim not to change any evidence. But computers, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. So you have to have principle two, which says, if you do change anything, be able to account for everything that you changed and what effect it had. You should record your actions and what occurred. Uh, you keep an audit trail of everything. And the fourth principle, someone has to be responsible. Someone has to be accountable for what actions were taken. And it might not be the operator who was doing it. It might be the person who was managing it but someone has to be accountable and you have to record who that was, so that when questioned, uh, they can justify. The unfortunate thing is that actually what we're practicing is poor science. The forensic tools we're using, uh, the major tools, uh, will I name them? Yeah, one. FTK, uh, NCASE, a number of free Linux-based tools, Unix-based tools. Um, where's the scientific proof? And the answer is these are commercial tools. They are generally accepted by the law enforcement community and generally accepted by the courts. But they would fail on the tests. If you if you apply Daubert, um, you know, they would fail. And having spoken to the manufacturers of a lot of software from the states, uh, it would fail on quality as well. Which is sort of scary when you're talking about forensic tools. Um, use of untested tools, general acceptance. Um, if I'm using a tool, uh, I will tend to use dual tool. I will use two different tools as long as I can replicate the results of one with another, then the law of diminishing returns says they're probably telling me the truth. Yeah. If I use two tools that have been developed totally separately and can get the same results, then that's normally considered to be good enough. Uh, the probability of them both returning the same wrong answer is almost zero. Um, Repeatability. Uh, and this is where we're moving more towards art than science, because we're moving more into mobile devices and we're moving more into things like Android, uh, where you know, uh, Microsoft, for whatever you may all like or dislike it, uh, has been produced for a long time. The code is well known. It may not be public, but it is well known. Um, Android has been around for four years and now takes more than 25% of the market. And we're now on release, I think it's 4.7. So whereas Microsoft, you know, we saw <coughs> Windows 3.1, uh, 2000, uh, 2003, 
XP Vista 2007-2008. They only release a new version every couple of years, because that's good business. <laughs> uh, Android has only been around for three, four years in public use, and we're already on version 4.7. Now, each time they revise a version, um, we've got to go back and learn what the differences mean. What changes have they made? How does it affect how data is stored? How does it affect how uh, the system works? Uh, the other thing is, on mobile devices, on a desktop computer or a laptop computer, uh, you can take an image of the data. The data on the disk. And you can replicate that. Uh, once you've captured the data, you put it on a disk, you can copy it, you can play with it, do all you like. But increasingly, disk size is getting bigger, so is RAM. So now, in the past, if you did a computer forensic, <coughs> uh, you had a choice. Uh, depending on what state the machine it was in when you found it, if it was turned off, no problem. You just image the disk. If it was turned on, you had to decide, did you want to do an image of the RAM and all that might be in the RAM before you turned it off? And there's a, a trade-off there. Uh, to image the RAM, you need to change the image that's going to be on the hard disk because you need to install the software or the RAM. Um, so there's, someone has to make a trade-off. But it, you know, when we only have 128, 256, 512 meg of RAM, normally the decision was, don't bother. Because uh, there wasn't the skill there or the tools there either. Now we are talking 4, 8, 16 gig of RAM. Which at the time when we got 128 meg of RAM was bigger than the hard disk. You know, so there's a lot of data potentially in RAM. So increasingly, you have to make the decision. You know, is it worth capturing the volatile stuff in RAM and risking? Uh, you know, the other thing is, if the machine is encrypted, you need to capture the data while it's live, while the machine is switched on. Because if you let it close down and become encrypted, you are you have problems. You have problems that you didn't have when it was open. Okay. Uh, so there's lots of more things. Android, uh, mobile devices in general. It is very difficult to take a physical image of a mobile device uh, because you can't replicate it. If you did it now and did it again now, your images would be different. And that's because they have embedded clocks. Uh, so uh, you could do a logical acquisition, but you can't do a physical acquisition. There's all sorts of problems that make it very difficult to do good science. And that's where it becomes much more of an art. How do you make the decision uh, whether to do RAM or just do the hard disk? And the answer is, it's going to be a judgment call based on what you know, on the intelligence you've got. Uh, and that's not science. That's art. Okay. We tend to think of forensics as being criminal forensics, and that's the one we talk about, but actually, investigative uh, forensics, intelligence, my background is military intelligence. Uh, and I actually got involved in forensics just as uh, PCs were getting into common use, because my concern was that as my role at that time was running the army security. IT security team. But I was very conscious that the probability was I would be carrying out a, a security task, intelligence based, and I would run across a criminal event. And so at the time, the only people who did computer forensics was the Metropolitan CCU, the Computer Crime Unit, under John Austin. And so I trogged up to London and sat down with him and said, how do we deal with this? Uh, and that worked out quite well. The interesting thing was, six months later, I had to ring him up and ask a favour. 
because we had a file running on my desk uh, that someone claiming to have broken into an army computer. Uh, some degree of detail, not enough to convince, but certainly enough to. Uh, so I persuaded them at CCU uh, to go and do a raid. Uh, tremendous fun. <laughs> Was 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 for some in the army. <laughs> Early morning wake up call. Hell that. Uh, but it was all part of this the trade off between intelligence and uh, criminal. Uh, there are time. It, we hear about intelligence led policing. Uh, it is an aspiration. I don't think it's too much of a reality. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that. It's not criticism. It's just the way things are. Um, I had an ongoing debate with the police in this region of South Wales who were locking up lots of criminals on computer evidence. I come from an intelligence background and I'm saying to them, yeah, okay, you discover enough evidence to convict someone and then you quite rightly stop because you don't have infinite resource. You have more than enough evidence to get a conviction uh, for that crime. But what else is on that disk? What other intelligence is on that disk? Uh, and to cut a long story short, uh, it was actually uh, Exeter, uh, through a disk at me. Uh, they had just locked up a paedophile, uh, dead straightforward, and they'd done him for possession, uh, which is the bottom tier of the crime. And they said, all right, put your money where your mouth is. What else is on there? Uh, and so I spent time going through it. It's a resource the police don't have. It's a luxury they don't have by and large because it's manpower intensive. Uh, what came out of this was they'd actually done him for the wrong crime. He wasn't using, he was distributing. And the other thing that came out was seven other names. And these were seven unknown names, as it turned out, uh, who happened in a the link back to Australia, these were all Australians. Uh, uh, so it was fed back. What I didn't know was that the Exeter police fed it back through Interpol, and I was getting off a train in London, attending a meeting, and I got a phone call from the Australian High Commission saying, can you tell us any more? This was nine months later. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Well, we're going to kick indoors in, in two hours' time. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, but the nice thing was, you know, it achieved what it was supposed to. Um, intelligence and criminal investigations do sit side by side. I would say that. That's my background. Uh, but don't forget, there's also data recovery. Post-incident data recovery. You've had malware, you've had a loss. Uh, you need to know what happened. You need to get your business continuity head in and your data recovery head in and restore your systems. So you need potentially forensics for that. And if you want to make lots of money, data discovery, civil litigation, uh, mergers, takeovers, uh, data discovery is the thing, the big and increasing thing. Um, data discovery is not about structured data. It isn't about logs, it's about unstructured data emails, uh, word documents, the like, because you're looking for specific communications for specific uh, files. Um, and you could be talking about petabytes of data. So, non-trivial. Uh, but good fun. Uh, okay, just to take you through. Uh, Uh, investigations, criminal investigations, it's all type of crimes. People who get murdered, people who commit suicide, <coughs> people who go missing have mobile phones. They have digital devices, they have digital cameras, uh, all of which can be potential sources of evidence. GPS systems, engine management systems, uh, again, they're not the areas we conventionally think about, but all potential sources of evidence. Your fridge, your washing machine, 
why did you run your washing machine at midnight on that day? Uh, you know, why are your clothes being cleaned when you normally only use the cycle every three days and do it at two o'clock in the morning when you've got cheap electricity? Why did you run it then? Not evidence, it's just indicators. But it's useful. Uh, okay, sorts of things. I'm not going to go through them, but again, it's all sorts of crimes. The process. You have an incident, be it a crime, be it a network intrusion, be it malware. So the first thing you want to do is maintain, preserve it, maintain the evidentiary chain. Then you want to collect it. You, you want to freeze the scene uh, to make sure nothing's changed. Very much the same as a physical scene, you want to preserve the electronic scene. Then you want to collect the data in a scientifically, oh, no, forensically sound manner. <laughs> then you want to examine it. You, do, you want to do your analysis. Then at some point, you've got to present it. And I say to all the students that teach, you can be as good a, you can be as good a scientist, good as a technician as you like. If you can't communicate, you have just wasted all of that effort. Because actually, what you've done scientifically, what you've done all the investigation, all the analysis, is only as good as the report you write. Because that's what people see. Well, that's your communication, whether it's verbal, whether it's written. If it goes to court, it's probably both. Um, so, if you can't communicate, you've spent a lot of time and achieved nothing. Because unless you can put it in language that people understand, and it's persuasive, Evidence must be persuasive. It must also, yeah, must also be based on facts. Uh, so, interestingly, that, that this slide was taken from a workshop in 2001. And in truth, nothing's changed. It captured the essence. Lots of people seem to think that forensics is about using tools, FTP in case. And we do use them. We use them because they save us lots of time. But we should be able to understand what they're doing, and we should be able to add value and guide them. Uh, if you can't add value, uh, if you can't understand what you're looking for uh, from the start, people who if you're doing an investigation and someone gives you a disc and says, tell me what's on there, as a forensic investigator, if you don't give it back and say, no, go away, uh, you're not doing your job. Most computers these days contain in excess of a million files. What's on there? There's an operating system on there. There's applications on there. What are you looking for? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? Because you know, it, it's quite not uncommon that you'll go looking for one thing and find something else. Because people who do bad things tend to do, <coughs> they don't confine themselves to one bad thing, they'll do other bad things. So, um, you know, what are you trying to achieve? What was, it, it, I, I'm a Spanish linguist, and while I was in the military, I was posted to Central America. And two days after I arrived, I was sent out with SIB, CID equivalent, uh, to do an interview with no briefing. And we get there, and the policeman says, Can you ask her who left the shoe in the shower in the sergeant's mess? And I went, This interview's over. <laughs> and walked out. And I said, when He was furious. I said, You wasted everybody's time. Uh, I said, What are you trying to find out? You know, who, what do you think, who did to whom? And when I understand that, I know the right questions to ask him uh, in Spanish. Uh, I also learned in Central America, asking the question is fine, understanding the answer is something totally different. Uh, because they don't speak uh, Castilian Spanish in Central America. Uh, so, you've got to understand what the context is before you can really do it. You've got to be closely tied to the investigator. You are not the person running the investigation normally. You are providing evidence into that process or a feed into that. 
Uh, computer and network editor doesn't jump off the computer. You've got to know where to look, you've got to know what you're looking for. Yeah. If you're looking for a computer intrusion, are you going to spend a lot of time going through emails? No. You know, if you're looking at fraud, are you going to spend a lot of time looking at the logs? Probably not. You know, you've got to understand what the context is. You've got to be part of the team, because uh, they've got to feed you. And by and large, it's getting better, but you've got to prompt them uh, as to what questions they should be asking. What is likely to be available? And if you can steer them, it's a two-way street. Uh, you know, okay. Uh, I come back to, you've got to add value. It's not just about using tools. Any monkey can use a tool, and a lot of them do. Um, it's actually adding value and understanding what the tool is doing. And if you're not getting what you need by using a tool, how else can you go about finding that evidence? It's understanding how the operating systems work. It's understanding how the applications work. It's understanding where to look for evidence. And given we've got now, as I say, we've got OS X, we've got Android, we've got Windows, uh, we've got cloud computing, Jurisdictional, potential jurisdictional nightmare. Uh, understand your trade. <coughs> Where's it going? It's getting better. Wider range of tools, more automation. We need more automation because disks are getting bigger. You can. It is not unusual to find one to two terabytes on a desktop. My laptop's got a terabyte. Uh, it's got a 64-bit i7, you know, quad-core i7 processor, an 8 gig of RAM. Uh, I dreamed of that on a desktop five years ago. Uh, a terabyte on a laptop. Uh, so conventional desktop now is at least a terabyte, potentially two. Uh, you can buy now four terabytes of external storage for 120 quid. I can't feel one. And trust me, I never throw an eagle away. Okay. Uh, it's becoming more complex. We've got disk forensics. That's what used to be, we used to call computer forensics, that and a bit of network forensics. Uh, now we've got live memory forensics, as I say, you know, 4, 8, 16 gig of RAM. Uh, you can't ignore it. And you can get quite a lot of useful uh, intelligence or evidence out of it. But it's not science because you can't replicate it. And this is where, you know, is it forensically acceptable? Yes, the courts accept light memory forensics. They accept that you can't replicate it. Mostly. Uh, it depends on the techniques and tools you use to acquire it. Uh, we're seeing tablets, smartphones are increasing. They're so cheap now, everybody's got them. Uh, I say engine management, home management, uh, fridge management, washing machine management, uh, smart meters. Uh, so you've got to be multitask, you've got to be multi skilled, you've got to understand quite a lot. And the best thing you've got to understand is what you can't do, what your limitations are. I know what mine are, and I don't do networks. <laughs> you know? If I want networks, then I'll get someone else in because I mean, you can't be good at it all. Uh, you may be good at bits. Some of the issues increasing range of devices, encryption. I haven't mentioned encryption except for saying, you know, you might want to capture a machine while it's up and running rather than let it be shut down. Um, massive problem. What resources have you got to deal with encryption? Shh, none. <laughs> Intact. Uh, yeah, quite. <laughs> Lots goes in, not much comes out. Uh, but globally, the whole point of encryption is, you know, uh, if, if you're using government level encryption, you expect 30 years of protection. And this, you know, with PGP, with TrueCrypt, with uh, it's pretty damn close. 
Okay, nobody guarantees you're going to get 30 years, but you know, who needs 30 years for a PC? In five years, it'll be dead anyway. And, uh, yeah, storage volumes. Not only are we talking about increasingly large storage volumes, but how do you preserve the evidence in a stable state? It used to be that we used to copy it to DVD, which we know are good for at least five years, except some jurisdictions want 75 years, uh, Australia in particular. Um, but can you imagine taking a terabyte and writing it to DVD? Dream on. Not going to happen. Nobody's going to do that. You, couldn't, you wouldn't have the physical storage if you wanted it. So there are issues. If we store it on hard disks, uh, hard di you know, uh, roughly speaking, storage, uh, processing speeds, storage doubles in every 18 months. So, whatever, however good your planning is, uh, it's never going to be enough. And you're never going to convince the powers that be who allocate budgets why you would need that much storage, because they don't understand the problem. Um, time to process. Tools are getting faster, processes are getting faster, but they are still, you know, it is still a significant and increasing problem. As I say, average million files per machine. I'll come up with some figures in a bit, give you some idea. Um, not too relevant how big the, device, the storage is. That's a, a straight mathematical scale. It's the indexing of the files that takes quite a lot of time. Uh, OK, academic research. Uh, you know, the science bit. <laughs> uh, how many universities are doing scientific research and how many of them have ties to law enforcement community to understand what their problems are? It's great doing abstract theoretical problems, but it would be nice if we also did some applied and tried to solve some of the problems that are being faced. And that involves a relationship. Now, law enforcement aren't good either, because they don't trust anybody. Uh, so, you know, talking to academics, phew, it, it takes time. Um, qualifications and standards. Where do you get your qualifications? Well, you come here. Or you go to Glamorgan, or you go to Royal Holloway. Oh, sorry, I don't want to have a couple of others. But they're young. It's a, it's a young discipline. It's, I, a few years back, I stood up and said, you know, look, digital forensics is young. You know, it's less than 30 years old. A sort of smart ass came up and said, well, so did DNA. <laughs> yeah, but how many times has DNA changed in the last 30 years? Uh, the answer is DNA is DNA. Nothing has changed in it. Unless we go into genetics. But, but realistically, nothing has changed in the basic DNA. The tools we use have got better and better. In computer forensics, everything has changed. There are no baselines that are more than three or four years old because the technologies develop and evolve. So we're shooting at a moving field, whereas they have a very fixed one. Uh, cost and quality of training. It's hugely expensive. Uh, quality variable. It's sad, but true. Uh, most people will go for certification through vendors. Uh, down to the guy who's teaching you. At least in academic environments, uh, it tends to be more generic, more broad based, and it tends to have some quality control on it. Uh, I have certainly attended uh, commercial forensic courses, and the guy at the front has been reading. You know, I don't need you to read, I can do that myself. Value add. Let me gain from you. It, when I taught at, I used to teach at uh, what's now University of South Wales. And I used to get into all sorts of brief because I used to get law enforcement in to give lectures. They've been doing it for 15 years. If they don't understand, if they haven't got that anecdotal experience and knowledge, uh, they were there to get a professional 
an academic qualification for their experience or credit. Yeah. But they've got so much to contribute. So I used to get, I used to get into all sorts of grief from uh, certain academics who didn't think you should do that. Yeah. But if someone's been doing a practitioner for 15 years, I think they probably know what they're Okay, data volumes. If you take something like a three gig quad core, uh, can do about 75 to 100 files a second, full text indexing 30 to 35 files a second. If you take an average of a million files, it's going to take about 11 and a half hours to process. You hope. Probably longer. Okay. Just to make a point, the number of different operating systems that are about, this isn't a full list, this is just the more common ones. Uh, there are lots of others. And if you just take Linux, the different flavors of Linux. Okay. I'm nearly finished, but I think we've got three slides left. We have a, one of the issues we have is the CSI effect. Everybody watches CSI, and it's a damn good show, it's very entertaining. But they think that everything can be solved in an hour. And they think you're always going to solve it. And have you noticed in CSI, the guilty guy always coughs at the end. Just to tidy it off nicely. Thank you, you wish. Um, okay. <laughs> you, as the technologies become more embedded, as they become more widespread, and Diverse. So we're going to see digital forensics evolve in much more non-digital crime. Uh, always going to be resource problems. Uh, come back to my comment about police and you know the priority. If you're accountable locally, you know they want to know what's happening about burglaries, about drugs, about street crime. Digital crime in a priority is sort of way down there, because it's not a visible crime, except for, as I say, pedophilia. Uh, increasing range of technologies, ongoing arms race to keep up. You're always following, you're always responding, you're never leading. So you're always going to be a little behind the curve. Uh, the whole aim of forensics is to put a pair, someone's fingers to the keyboard, and that actually is the most difficult bit of all. You can work out what happened, you can work out when it happened, probably where it happened, but actually tying an individual to a keyboard at that time uh, is difficult. <coughs> uh, it's becoming more, the environment's becoming more professional and that's to be applauded. We're seeing increased regulation. regulation. Uh, you've got a forensic regulator. It's not digital forensics, it's all forensics. Andrew Rennes and Ben and uh, But he is determined to include digital forensics. The unfortunate thing is when you mix the regulations for running labs that do web forensics with digital forensics, it doesn't work. The sort of rules you need for protecting people in a work environment in a web lab are a bit different to that in a digital lab. Uh, Forensic readiness. Organizations are starting to get the message that if you prepare for an incident and you collect the right logs and you monitor the right things, when you've had an incident, you've actually got a chance of doing a forensic investigation. You know, we've had an incident, we've taken our systems down, we've stolen all our data. Okay, how much monitoring do you do? We don't do anything. You know, uh, sorry, <laughs> and you want me to give, give you what? You know, um, greater use of encryption. Uh, one thing that stuns me is that the disks that we looked at in the disk studies, the low level of use of encryption. Given that you've got things like BitLocker, uh, TrueCrypt. I use TrueCrypt. Uh, uh, don't use BitLocker. But uh, out of looking at probably 1,500 disks over five years, uh, we only saw two that were encrypted. Go for you. And just a, as an interest, straw poll. How many people here use encryption? Okay, now we're sort of an exclusive group in that we have an interest in this sort of thing. 
uh, but that was sort of about 50-60%. Uh, I don't think there's anything on my computer uh, that is going to change the world. Uh, my own personal protection, my own identity protection, yeah, I'll use encryption to protect that. Uh, or not put it on the computer, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, okay. Uh, increased use of anti forensics, it's the arms race. Uh, criminals who have technical knowledge, and just because you're a criminal, doesn't mean you're stupid. Uh, but conversely, it doesn't mean you're not. It also doesn't mean you're technically competent. So, you know, criminals will delete data thinking they've got rid of it. Uh, great. Uh, come back to increasing number of forensic cases not being successfully prosecuted. And that's for a whole range of reasons. But remember, if you take a case to court, they're going to attack three things. They're going to attack the evidence, they're going to attack the person delivering the evidence, and they're going to attack the process that was used to get the evidence. And so unless your processes and procedures are absolutely spot on, you're going to get thrown out on technical issues. Then you've got to convince the jury or the judge that what you're saying has merit. So you've got to be able to present it as well. And you've got to create, you've got to, in UK, you've got to persuade the CPS that it's worth taking. Uh, okay, cyber warfare, um, it's a reality. We've seen it in Chechnya, we've seen it in Estonia, we see it between China and Japan and Nepal and India and Pakistan and lots of others, North and South Korea. It's happening, it just doesn't affect us greatly. Things we can do, uh, getting better. In the field, there's two areas in the field and in the lab. Uh, being able to triage. Uh, interestingly, working with university in Australia. Australia has a unique problem of geography. It's big. It's absolutely enormous. So policemen have to cover vast tracts of land. So. If they go out to do a forensic investigation, a computer forensic investigation, the likelihood of having someone skilled that they can send out is quite small, uh, and is proximity to the crime. So they may have to send someone a day out in the field uh, to do an imaging or a preview of a machine to work out whether it's worth arresting someone, because you don't want to arrest someone, bring them a day back to find out that they shouldn't have arrested them in the first place, any triaging tools. Uh, and those are getting better. And Interestingly, as say Australia, uh, work with them to produce a tool uh, that would allow policemen to do that, to non-invasively uh, preview the machine uh, so that they could look and make a decision on the spot. Are we going to take him back with us or do we walk away? Uh, okay, ability to identify encryption, yeah. Uh, improve plug and play but all USB devices. We're moving away. It used to be you used to put a CD or a DVD in the, the boot from that. Uh, it's, it's old technology. USBs uh, are where we're at. Uh, improved indexing, data recovery, and vis data visualization. When you're talking large sets of data, big data, you need tools to let you understand it because, you know, if you're just looking at file lists, it's meaningless. You need better ways of seeing what the data is. Uh, and those are coming along. Uh, here's a question, rather. When you get, it used to be when you went, you looked at what was plugged into the back of the computer, so that you understood what other devices might be relevant to the investigation. And then this funny old technology called Wi-Fi came along. So we now have remote storage, and we have remote connectivity to other devices perhaps not in the same premises. Perhaps they're in next door or across the way. So how do you determine what's relevant to the case that you're investigating? Um, and there are increasingly good tools for working out uh, direction and range. <laughs> uh, 
improved imaging technology. Uh, instead of looking at file systems and disks, we're now starting to look at the file as the atomic level. Before we used to talk about computers and disks, now we're looking at files, because the file may be on the computer, it may be in RAM, it might be up in the cloud, it might be on remote storage stuff. So, uh, and again, we're back to storage on the investigations. Uh, we need better compression, we get it. In the lab, we need to finish. Use of distributed architectures. Uh, it used to be that we used to put it on a central server because that we could keep secure and manage. Uh, we're now having to distribute it to do it better. Better data mining tools, uh, more to use the mode <coughs> so that you can have more than one investigator working on a case at a time. Uh, back to better visualization and increased use of visualization. Uh, Unstructured data. It, it is time consuming, it is difficult. Uh, if you've done your indexing well, that can help. But unstructured data uh, is certainly increasingly useful. I will say thank you very much indeed, Hi, Luke. Thank you.